The Sovereign Citizen Routine. How to properly go about exuding, confirming, and upholding your quote-unquote figurative rights as a so-called sovereign citizen in the correct way, distinguished from the incorrect way, which we see almost across the board everywhere, because most people are just too fucking stupid. So they don't understand the difference between actually going about how to exude yourself as a quote-unquote sovereign citizen from just being a fucking doofus in the name of such. So the first thing I want everybody to look into, if you haven't done so already, and this is the reason people need to sit down and read physical books. Go to a library, go somewhere that has books physically, and read a physical book about the English Civil War, specifically about King Charles I. So King Charles I is the embodiment, he is the living physical example of the bullshit sovereign citizen routine and how you should not go about that. Okay? He's literally the living example that every so-called sovereign citizen after him in the modern era is basically trying to emulate more or less his behavior without even realizing it. So the first thing you need to understand about King Charles and really let this sink in. You really need to have this sink into you. If you're one of these people inclined towards this conspiracy hype train stuff and really gung ho about your sovereign citizenship and all this jazz, you really need to understand the reality of, how many fucking actual rights King Charles had. All right? So sit down and read a book thoroughly on the life of King Charles I, the English Civil War, and everything that eventually led up to him being executed. How many different chances he was given to just be a reasonable person, a reasonable king, and he could have easily prevented the English Civil War and saved his life and prevented the deaths of hundreds of thousands of fucking people if he just hadn't been, number one, stupid as fuck and stubborn as fuck, okay? In his misguided idealism, all right? So the first thing you need to understand about King Charles is that he was literally on paper and acknowledged by the pretty much the entire populace that he ruled over as having a divine right to rule over every single one of them. He is literally listed in the law books as the sovereign. Okay? Which means he has the divine right, according to how people saw things back then in relationship to him, kings, etc. People literally believed he had the divine right implanted in him by God to decide who lived or died, to declare who was executed or not, etc. Right? Now, by the time of King Charles, you had this thing called Parliament starting to come in, which was an attempt to have checks and balances on the king having excessive power and ability to just do whatever the hell he wants, whenever he wants, right? But still, the king was still acknowledged as the sovereign, so he could still overrule Parliament and these other principles, and it was listed in the law books that he had the right, the divine right, to do so at his discretion, right? So where basically Parliament was more or less just a thing he was, in his kind graces, allowing to exist, to voluntarily balance out his power, but he didn't technically have to allow it to exist. He could have just decided to dissolve it, and he actually did. And this is exactly what led to the English Civil War. In fact, the first battles of the English Civil War were fought over, specifically the Battle of Edge Hill and a few other key battles. They were fought over who would be controlling the army to fight against the Scots and the Irish, not who would be controlling the English army to fight against these other groups. So the war wasn't, the initial battle wasn't even about who was going to rule England or not. It was about who was going to control the army. So Parliament wanted to control the army and the King Charles was like, no, I'm going to control the army. And then because it was a stalemate, well, everything else kicked off and the rest is history. If one side had had a definitive victory at Edge Hill, well, The English Civil War probably would not have happened, at least nowhere near the degree of intensity and violence that it did. Okay, so this this is the first thing you need to have fully sink in. King Charles literally was acknowledged as an actual sovereign 
in the real sense. Sovereign means king, all right? So you declaring yourself a sovereign citizen, you're literally declaring yourself a king. That's what that means. Sovereign means you're above the law. That's what sovereign means. It means you're not bound by laws. You are the sovereign. You have the divine right to rule and declare what happens to you and others around you. That's what sovereign actually means if you're an actual sovereign. Okay? Anything less than that, you're not an actual fucking sovereign. So cut it. Okay? If you're not literally a king, acknowledged in the legal books as being a king, your own king, you're not a fucking sovereign. It's that simple. Okay? So King Charles was an actual sovereign. Now, being an actual sovereign, this is literally the extent to the degree that this was acknowledged in him during the 1600s at this time period. <clears throat> literally, the opposing generals of him that were fighting against him, that were sending armies against him and his, his armies, shooting at him and his armies, they literally had it still in their heads that even if they won huge numbers of battles against him, he was still their king at the end of the day. He was still the sovereign. Do you understand the implications of what that means? Of how many luxuries you have to survive and to maintain your life if you get captured over and over and over again, what that means for your own personal safety and protection. If people still consider you their king, even if they've defeated you in war for fuck's sake, think about that for a minute. <clears throat> Nobody else has that luxury or that degree of support from the people, even remotely in the modern era. So what to speak of you, who's not even in a position of large scale political power. Be real. Okay. So what happened was, sure enough, over a prolonged series of battles, etc., <clears throat> King Charles was eventually captured, and he was given every opportunity to be reasonable and meet the demands and compromise to what Parliament wanted. He was still going to be allowed to be the king, to have his position, right? To be acknowledged as the sovereign, with all these caveats added, where basically his power is just going to be slightly to various degrees minimized from what it was before. After a fucking war! But nope, what did he have to do? He had to keep playing the sovereign citizen, the, the sovereign, not even a sovereign citizen, the sovereign routine, right? He, he was just hell-bent and stubborn that no, he is the king, he is the sovereign, and he will never bend the knee to the demands of parliament because he is the divine ruler of the people, no matter what, under all circumstances. To the point that it literally cost him his life. He was stubborn to the point that it cost him his fucking head. When he could have just easily conceded to the very reasonable demands in many cases of the majority of the populace and parliament, etc. There was only a small subset of the population comparatively that actually wanted him executed. Most people, even most of those who fought against him in many battles still didn't want him executed. They're just like, we just want this to register to him, to him to finally cede to what we want and our demands. We don't want to not to be without a king. We don't want him to not be our king. We just want him to be reasonable to what we're needing to have happen. Because here's the other thing you got to understand. Back in those days, having an actual king just being there <laughs> was a buffer to far worse forms of chaos and horror that would be inflicted on you without the king. So even if the king was corrupt and made a shit ton of fucking mistakes, like King Charles did, it was still more advantageous to have one versus not, because you're open to far more horrors without the king there, right? In many cases. So... <clears throat> The vast majority of the populace didn't want him executed. And to this day, many people are like, it was such a tragedy that he was executed. If he was just not so fucking stubborn, he would have not been executed. And that's the reality. That's the fucking truth of it. But he had to dig his heels in. He had to be bullheaded about it. And so what he did was he arranged his escape from his capture. And when he did that, and he tried to raise another army... <laughs> From the islands that he was hiding on. Oh, fuck. What everybody was all right. This king just has to die now. Like, not everybody. In fact, most people still didn't want him to be executed, even after that, for fuck's sake. But there was enough people at that point that were just, all right, this motherfucker is just unimaginably stubborn in terms of his claim that he is the sovereign above everybody's laws and rules and regulations and everybody else and everybody else has continually acknowledged this in him, and he just keeps abusing this over and over and over and over again. We've just got to get rid of the fucker, right? 
We gave him every goddamn... We've literally won a war against the fucker, and we gave him the opportunity to maintain his life after a fucking war and stay the king after we beat him in war. And he still just spits in our face and tries to pull this and tries to raise another army against us yet again. When we could have... When he doesn't even realize the luxury we gave him in not killing him right out the bat instead of capturing him. What an ungrateful piece of shit, basically. And that's basically the psychology of his most fanatical opponents. And so when he got beheaded, a lot of the audience was just in shock. They gasped. They were just in horror that things got to that point. But it, it illustrates and it shows it's the living embodiment of what happens even if you are an actual fucking sovereign. If you're a stubborn ass and you're unreasonable with people, you just get killed or you just have a shit ton of people fucking hate you because of it. Okay, so this is this is the lesson that the so-called sovereign citizens of today filling America and other countries need to learn and understand. Okay. You aren't the king of the country. You don't own the road yourself. So the most common thing that happens in terms of people exuding their sovereign citizenship in the wrong way, in the wrong context, is during traffic stops. They go on the whole spiel about I'm traveling, not driving, and blah, 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 blah. So even though hyper-technically, yes, what you're saying is correct, it's not recognized in the law books or in the practical world as being the reality. Okay, so it's not going to be recognized or acknowledged is the thing you need to understand, because here's why you're being pulled over in an imminent situation. So there's two different sets and two different standards of behavior and interaction with the police that apply in terms of you protecting your legal rights. One is imminent. Okay, stuff going on right then and there happening actively in the moment and them coming to you later about something that happened before posthumously. There's a totally different standard of interaction for that from things that are imminently going on, okay? This is the main central point that these so-called sovereign citizens, they don't understand. They think imminent interactions, it's the same set of standards as posthumous interactions with the police pertaining to previous incidences that aren't happening right then, okay? So a traffic stop, well, the first thing you need to understand, all right, about the roads is you don't yourself own the roads. You are a co-owner of the roads, a co-owner with millions of other people who also along with you own the road as well. You're together co-owners of the road. So what does that mean? It means that you're held to the same standards that all the other co-owners of the road are held by in terms of what's in the law books and in terms of how these roads are allowed to be used in the sense of you're required just like they are to stop at a stoplight. Just because you're hyper-technically a sovereign in principle, in terms of the ideals of America, it doesn't give you the right to run a red light and declare, oh, I'm just traveling, so therefore I can just drive through red lights and through green lights as I feel like it and not be held to the same standards. Yeah, you might be able to get away with it if there's not a cop around, sure. But that doesn't mean you actually have a right to do so. Because you have millions of other co-owners of the road whose taxes along with yours have contributed to building the road and maintaining it. And the enforcers of all the co-owners, not just you, but in, you included, are the police. They're the enforcers of the co-owners of the road along with you. In other words, all the other sovereigns who also own the road with you together. You see? So it's, it's like these sovereign citizens, they don't understand that in America, in the United States of America, when you have everybody everywhere in the hyper-technical sense being considered a sovereign, well, it means you're all together held, holding each other to the same standard. So if you have a room full, think about this, if you have a room full of 100 fucking kings in that room, and all the kings are agreeing together on their standards and rules and regulations, yes, you're all hyper-technically on paper, according to yourselves, sovereigns, and this is how on paper in America it's been declared. Everybody that lives in America and exists is hyper-technically a sovereign, right? You, me, the president, everybody else. But that's not in practice how it plays out, but hyper-technically, yes. So, but here's the thing. Guess what? We're living in a tradition 
where all these sovereigns together before us got together and said, okay, we as all our individual sovereigns, we're going to together agree on the regulations that are going to be imposed on all of us together in terms of how we all together use the roads and are able to use them together as the mutual co-owners of the roads. Now, if sovereign citizens understood that this is actually what's happening, they would understand, oh, therefore, that's why I'm actually still held to the same laws as everybody else, because they're also sovereigns, too. So that policeman pulling you over, guess what? He's also a sovereign. Not just you. He's a sovereign, too. So since he's also a sovereign, and she, he or she is also a sovereign, they, as a co-sovereign to you, have the right to hold you to the laws that you, by appearing in this world, by signing off, by agreeing to align with a birth certificate and an ID card and all these other things, that you agreed to mutually be adhered to along with them, they can hold you to those things legally because they're also a sovereign as well as you, not just you, okay? So <clears throat> this is what's really going on. People get in their heads that, Sovereign means that they are this like outlying separate individual from everybody else and everything else, this aloof. In other words, they basically treat themselves like King Charles in relationship to the populace. Like they have these extra additional rights as a sovereign and all these people who have agreed to all these other things are not sovereigns. No, they're also sovereigns too in hyper-technical principle. So because they're also sovereigns, they can together overrule your sovereignty legally. If you have three kings agreeing against another king, saying, hey, we're going to have this be the case, even though this particular king disagrees with us, well, you have three sovereigns versus one sovereign. Do you see? And this is how the Wild West operated. Everybody who was legally allowed to carry firearms and weapons around, and in the United States, you are legally allowed to carry around weapons as well in specific states, including Idaho. Because your sovereign rights are acknowledged in terms of weapon carrying here in this particular region. And so in the Wild West, since that was the case everywhere, <coughs> then what you had was sheriff systems. Because guess what? The sheriff is also a sovereign, holding you to your sovereign agreements with other sovereigns. Do you see now what's actually going on here? Do you understand the difference now between... You being a dumbass bullshitter, declaring rights above and independent and outside of all the other sovereigns, and the reality of what it means to actually be a sovereign citizen means literally that you are actually held to the laws of everybody else. In the context of America specifically, the United States specifically, in the hyper-technical sense, okay, which is not the practical real world sense of things. So I hope that clarifies it very well. Now... We're going to go into the details of what people get wrong when they shouldn't declare and go on this sovereign citizen spiel. In fact, you, you should never go on a sovereign citizen spiel because it's going to make you look like an idiot because others won't understand what you're talking about. Some might and some will, but it's going to be irrelevant because it's unnecessary. That's the, that's the point. It's unnecessary, even though it's hyper technically correct. It's unnecessary and will just screw you over. All right. So first of all. Let's talk about, this is how it actually works in the law also. And people, you really need to write this down. If you're listening to this video and put this to memory. Don't forget this. If you are approached by the police, for example, if you are the one driving and a police has his lights on and you're the one imminently right then and there being signaled to pull over by the policeman, that's recognized in the law books as a signifier of whatever is in front of the policeman needing to pull over, okay? If you are the one being flagged for that, then, okay, you pull over because it's imminent. It's going on right there. So him coming up to you and asking you for your basic information, information he can find anyway or she can find anyway if you're going to be a stubborn jackass and make them have the inconvenience of having to look it up anyway. Um, that basic information, number one, your name, and your driver's license is it's just a basic common courtesy to save him the trouble and the headache of having to separately look up your stuff from your license plates, right? He's going to get it either way. So just be reasonable and make it convenient for them to find it easier, right? <laughs> so once that information is looked up, 
your record is going to be seen in terms of what other infractions, traffic violations you've been engaged in, et cetera. So usually the most common one is speeding, right? You're speeding. Usually people only get pulled over for 15 miles or more over the speed limit, right? If you're five to 10 miles over, very rarely does anyone ever get pulled over for that. Almost never, right? Technically it's possible, but it's, it almost never happens. <laughs> usually there has to be something else going on on top of the speeding for them to be able to pull you over. If it's 10 or five miles over, there has to be something else going on other than just the speeding, but they can use the speeding as an additional reason to have to pull you over. So, <clears throat> but past 10 miles an hour, 15, you know, thereabouts, yes, they can legally pull you over without needing any additional reason to do so. Right. Uh, because they're also bound by the same sovereign sit and they're also a sovereign along with you. Okay. So, <clears throat> When they come up and they ask you that, and they, they ask you, do you know why, why I'm pulling you over? That is not the time to remain silent or be stubborn because this isn't a posthumous interaction. They're not coming to you about something that happened before. They're coming to you about something that's happening then. Okay, do you know right now, in this moment today, right here, why I currently am pulling you over right now in this moment? So explaining yes or no that you do understand or don't understand and asking what the reason is, et cetera, just having a reasonable discussion about what the situation is, is totally reasonable and is the thing you should do in an imminent pullover situation without elaborating beyond what you're asked. Okay. Just answer only the questions and don't elaborate. Okay. No need to elaborate because it's unnecessary and it doesn't help you. Okay. Unless they ask for elaboration, then you can, right? Or if they're asking you the specific reason, then you can specify what the exact reason is, you know, mental condition, mental state, this and that, some situation going on, so that and the other, right? The reason at that time you don't want to invoke the right to remain silent is because you're not actually in a situation that's posthumous from the imminent situation. You're in the imminent situation, right? It's only posthumous interactions that you activate your right to remain silent. If they're approaching you asking you about something that happened before that isn't Im imminently going on right then and there. Okay. <laughs> so that gets sorted out. You have the conversation, whatever it is, the situation is, and you either don't get the ticket, you get off or you do. And then you move on your merry way and they move on their way as well. Right. So that, that interaction is simply because, okay, you have violated the agreed upon rules that you agreed upon and all the other sovereigns agreed upon by agreeing to get a driver's license in the first place, by agreeing to operate a motor vehicle in the first place, by agreeing to use the road in the first place. Well, you're agreeing whether you sat in a room or not and say, I agree to these things because all the other sovereigns that exist have established that, okay, these are how the roads are to be used. So no sovereign is above these laws that all the sovereigns have mutually agreed on. You see? So <clears throat> that's why I say it, it's irrelevant when it comes to road stuff and traffic stops, you being a sovereign, this or that, it's, an, it's a redundancy principle. It's irrelevant. Of course, you're a sovereign in hyper-technical reality, in principle, in American ideal. But in practical reality, it, it's, a, it's irrelevant. It's just going to make you look like an idiot because people aren't going to understand the hyper-technicals to the degree that you do. OK, so it's it's not that the sovereign citizen thing is in and of itself an inaccurate thing. It's just a misguided idealism that people are not understanding correctly in terms of how it actually works. Right. It's not that they're it's not that in and of itself, it's a bad thing wanting to have your freedoms and all these other. Obviously, we all should have maximal freedoms as much as possible within the figurative sense. But it's simply they're misguided in how they're applying the sovereign citizen principle. Okay? They're, they're missing a few key things that they're not informed about correctly. Because most people don't really actually study history. They just are told things by people on YouTube or by a few lawyers here or there. There's, it's just a hodgepodge of information. But they're not actually historically familiar people. They don't understand what sovereign means in the actual historical context up until today, what it actually implies and how it works in the context of the USA distinguished from other countries, right? So sovereign, the principle, it doesn't apply to other countries the same way it does to the United States either. So what I'm talking about here 
applies to the United States standards of sovereign and what that means here. So if you're in Great Britain or you're in France or all these other places, don't be a fucking idiot because what they mean by sovereign is, and often very much specifically, is a drastically different thing from what we mean by sovereign in the United States of America, okay? Because America was founded on the principle that every individual that exists in it is a sovereign to the maximal degree possible, a co-king of the land, not a solo king, but a co-king, like right, a mutual king with other kings filling the land, right? That's the principle we adhere to in America, but that's not the standard of sovereign in other countries, right? Canada, Great Britain, all these other places, Australia, New Zealand. So people wonder, well, how is it that the government is able to just impose this and that these other countries were in the USA? It takes a lot more work to get new stuff imposed and to happen for the most part. And there's a lot more resistance. Well, it's because we're all in America acknowledged as co-sovereigns. So it's a bunch of disputing sovereigns fighting with each other and finally agreeing on something. Whereas in other countries, the sovereign is not oftentimes at all acknowledged as being any of the citizens. It's only the king or queen and a few handful members of parliament or whoever it is that's acknowledged as sovereigns. And the rest of you are not acknowledged as sovereigns at all in the law books, depending on the specifics, right? So I'm not speaking on any other country's laws here. I'm just saying that make sure you understand what the sovereign means in your own country. Okay. Don't think that the American standards of what that means actually apply to other countries because they don't actually in most cases. You're going to make a drastic mistake if you try to pull the stuff you're going to pull in the USA and these other countries uh, for this this reason, right? <clears throat> so it, it, it depends. It, it, every country is different. You know, Switzerland has different standards from, you know, Romania or whatever the hell else. Or Russia, different standards from somewhere else. It's not the same standards. So <clears throat> you can't assume that it is. You got to really be familiar with the history of that country, the laws in it, and the law books also. And what things actually mean. Okay. So imminent. So like, for example, you, in other words, you, this is another thing a lot of people don't understand. If you invoke your right to remain silent in an instance where you're not actually being detained or arrested specifically, and they haven't declared to you that they're actually holding you uh, detained or arrested either, or if they haven't declared to you that you are not free to go, that you're being held, Right. Until they let you go, if that hasn't occurred, you invoking your right to remain silent is you engaging in suspicious activity, and it can be used against you in court of law. This is something sovsits, sovereign citizen routiners need to understand and get updated on. The laws have especially changed in this regard since 2013 to 2015, thereabouts, where now, yes, the police and others can legally hold it against you. If you invoke your right to remain silent before they've declared to you in very emphatic terms that you are being detained, you're being held or you're being arrested. If you do it before then, you're factually engaging in what they can classify and use against you in court as suspicious activity, probable cause. Why are they invoking the right to remain silent even though they're not being detained, etc.? This is why you need to understand this distinction. So if a policeman drives by, let's, let's give another example of imminent, um, of imminency where you need to basically actually tell the policeman and it actually works to your benefit by saying one or the other, if it's an, a current situation. So if there's directly a drive by shooting and a policeman is driving by and they say, Hey, did you see the car where the shots came from? Do you see which direction the car drove? And if you actually saw the direction the car just drove, right there, it's imminent. It's going on right there today, that day. You're there, right? On the scene. Then you point, yes, that way. They went that way. You should tell them that. You shouldn't be like, I, I will not say anything. I declare my right to remain silent. That's literally absolute absurdity. And you see why they would have every reason to justifiably, legally, consider you to be suspicious. It's like, well, is this person specifically hiding the fact of who the drive-by shooters are. Is this person in cahoots with the drive-by shooters? Why are they igniting their right to remain silent, even though I'm not detaining them? What is up with this? Do you see? That's why imminent situations are very different from posthumous after situations, where you're being questioned about something that happened outside of the imminent direct situation, right? 
on a different day at a different time, right? <laughs> Pertaining to your own knowledge of something or involvement in something beyond the imminent questioning about what you saw happening in front of your eyeballs, okay? <laughs> or what you're directly physically doing. So if you're walking and you have a purse in your hand, let's say you're carrying the purse of your girlfriend, right? And there's another guy that ran past you with a purse that he stole. And then the guy walks up to you and he's like, um, and the police officer walks up to you. Uh, why is it, sir, that you're walking with a purse? We just got a report that a purse was stolen. Uh, did you either see the person who had the purse running past you? And why is it that you have this purse currently? Well, in that situation, you should explain to him why you have the purse. Because they're looking for a guy who is running around with a purse, who, st who stole a purse, right? <laughs> so you say, oh, yes, this purse is the purse of my girlfriend. <laughs> in fact, I can prove it to you, especially if her ID or something is in it. This is a lady I know. If you want to call her, you can to confirm that this is who she is, so on and so forth. This, this is hers. That's why I'm carrying it for her, blah, 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 right? <clears throat> but if you remain, oh... Uh, no, I will not talk to you. I respectfully decline. Well, you're not being detained. So why are you respectfully declining to speak anything if you're not being held by the police officer or under arrest? What is up with that? Why? So that's an indication that you actually did commit some sort of crime. So here is where the distinction lies. When you hear all this talk about you should never talk to the police, it's talking about posthumously. It's not talking about imminently. So let's... If a policeman comes to your door after something happened, after an incident went on, you were accused of something like later on, and then somebody, the policeman comes to your door and says, hey, I have a few questions for you. I have some questions to ask you about something that happened in the past. Let's say, you know, somebody was murdered or there was a theft or some other incident went on. Uh, do you know anything about this? So on and so forth, right? In that case, you simply ask, am I free to go? And if they say yes, then you're free to go. That's when you say, I respectfully decline to answer any questions. And the reality is, or let me, let me back up. Let me put it this way. If they come and ask you specifically, hey, uh, can we ask you some questions or can we talk to you? Are you willing to talk with us, et cetera, so on? They have to actually ask you if you're willing to talk to them or they can just directly ask the question and you have the ability to answer or not. But what you, you need to immediately ask, first off, is am I free to go? Okay? Am I free to go? Because by asking are you free to go, if you're actually free to go, then you're free to go. And if they give you any other answer than an affirmative, solid, yes or no, then <clears throat> you don't actually go any further. So <clears throat> once they say, yes, you're free to go, then you say, have a good day. You don't say, I won't be answering any, any questions. That's unnecessary to say that at that point, actually. Uh, you have the right to say, I won't be answering any questions. It's in and of itself. But the <clears throat> saying that in and of itself in that context can't be used against you because you asked for clarification whether you're free to go or not. And that's the context. So let me explain this in the best way I possibly can. So I feel like I kind of butchered that explanation, but I think you get what I'm trying to get at. So let's be very specific here. So step one, you're walking about, going about your day somewhere out and about, or you're at home and a policeman approaches you about something that happened before that isn't going on that day right then and there, right now. They're not imminently chasing somebody down or looking for somebody or asking you about something you're doing right then and there specifically, right? <laughs> And they ask you, well, do you know anything about what happened before this other day or this, this day, you know, in the past? And you, you, if you don't feel comfortable answering that question, and in that case, you shouldn't answer the question of the police because anything you say um, at any time 
can be used against you, whether it's outside of attainment or inside attainment, if it's pertaining to posthumous things, okay? So in the case of a posthumous incident that you're being asked about, you should invoke your right to remain silent because you need to ensure that you don't accidentally get self-incriminated because there's been cases where people have tried to help the police. They were fully innocent. They were wanting to help the police and they were the one that got arrested for a crime they never committed whatsoever. An innocent person strictly because they answered questions to the police posthumously in this type of a context, right? So you ask, am I free to go? Am I free? And you just keep asking that over and over. Am I free to go? And any policeman who understands what that means is going to recognize, okay, I have to let him know one way or the other if I'm detaining him, if I'm holding him for questioning, or I'm not. And if he says, no, you're being detained, you're not free to go, that means that you are he's not allowing you to have your standard freedoms of movement anymore. <laughs> so that means at that point, that's when you say, I, in that case, I respectfully decline to answer your questions. And that's how you answer it. You say, I respectfully decline. No, I will not be answering any questions. And if you're specifically arrested, that's when you invoke that you'll only be speaking to an attorney. Okay. So that's the little caveat. Technically, you can invoke speaking to an attorney earlier, but if you're only being detained, you can you should cap it off at I won't be answering any questions. Okay? And then if they push further and shift into actually putting you in the car, and then that's when you say, I will only be speaking to an attorney. As soon as they physically do something to you, if you're just situationally saying, no, you're not free to go verbally. Then you say, no, I won't be answering any questions. As soon as they physically do something to stop you or hold you, then you invoke, I will only be speaking to an attorney. As soon as they physically detain you, you see? <laughs> because according to the law books, if you haven't spoken to beliefs, if you just disagreed and you asked if you're free and you didn't answer the questions, they can't legally interrogate you because nothing you say can be used against you at that point legally. And you need to actually in action remain silent and not say anything in action. You need to actually be quiet. Vocally, right? <laughs> also, following through on what you've declared about your silence, right? This is how you go about it properly. You ask first, am I free to go? That's the question you ask. And until you get an affirmative either way, yes, you're free to go, or no, you're not free to go, then you don't go any further. As soon as they say, yes, you're free to go, then you immediately say, thank you, have a nice day. You actually don't say, I won't be answering any questions, even though technically you can, you should just say, Thank you. Have a nice day. That's the correct response. Okay. But if you're approached by them and they say, no, you're not free to go. You're, you're being detained. Anything other than yes, you're free to go and affirmative. Then you say, I respectfully decline to answer questions. No, I won't be answering any questions. No, sir. Respectfully. I won't be answering your questions. Or no, ma'am, etc. I won't respectfully and use the word respectfully because it helps. It's important to say that word, right? That you have respect for them in their position, but you recognize the law. And policemen who actually are not corrupt pieces of shit and evil pieces of shit will respect you doing this because this is what policemen tell their own kids. They tell their own family members, this is how you respond. If a policeman randomly comes up to you and asks you questions, you ask if you're free to go and until they declare one way or the other, whether you are free to go or not, that's that's going to determine what your next response is. Thank you. Have a nice day. If you, in the case of you are free to go and you just never answer the question at all or respectfully, I decline to answer your questions. Either answer is going to be determined strictly on whether you're free to go and they declare that or you're not. Right. Because if you're free to go, you don't have to answer their question. If you're not free to go, then you're being held against your will and you have to declare that you're only going to speak to an attorney because whether they say it or not, they don't have to verbally say anything you say can or will be used against you. That's already the case if you're being detained or arrested. Okay. Legally, that's the case. So you have the right and you should invoke the right to not self-incriminate because what they really mean is everything you say is being used against you. They only throw the word can in there to psychologically throw people off, to make them think, oh, maybe something I say might not be used against me. Maybe, possibly. They do that as an illusory tactic. That's why they say can and will. 
what they really mean is will, not the can, just throw the can part as if it doesn't exist coming out of their mouth. The will part is the part that's the reality of it, okay? And I mean everything you say. Everything you say. Even if it's to help them, even if it's to assist them in finding who uh, actually did the crime. And interrogators will actually confirm this to you. They're like, yeah, the the reason interrogation systems work so well on actual criminals for the most part um, is because actual criminals tend to be big talkers and they love talk, talk, talk with their stories. So it just spoons feeds police and uh, investigators everything they need because they just get handed everything they need by the idiotic criminal trying to talk his way out of stuff, right? Which never works because everything he's saying is just being used against him. It's literally just a big pile up of every word that comes out of his mouth used against him, used against him, used against him. They're just literally spoon feeding interrogators everything they need, right? And innocent people often make this mistake of agreeing to answer questions, thinking, oh, of course, I'm going to help. And of course, this is going to assist the police. But the fact is, it's irrelevant whether you answering the questions is going to help them or not, because the reality of it is you going in and answering those questions is specifically going to be used only against you. It's never going to be able to be legally used to help in principle, okay? Even if the real, the practical reality is that it helps find the criminal and they appreciate it situationally, there's absolutely no guarantee of that. There's every possibility you're going to get locked up as a 100% innocent person who's a talker, okay? So hopefully I've made myself abundantly clear in terms of how these things need to be gone about. <laughs> Don't get brash, don't get arrogant, don't be an asshole to police because you're just spoon-feeding them reasons to be more corrupt, to be more abusive with you, to be, you know, more of a jerk to you than they already are. Hell, even corrupt cops, for the most part, will appreciate you being baseline respectful. Firm yet respectful, right? Not an asshole, not a jerk. Because they also understand how the law works, right? In the standards that they're held to. In principle, whether in reality or not, right? So, of course, yes, there are still police that engage in crimes as policemen and don't acknowledge these principles either as policemen. <laughs> but you can bring them to court and hold them to account for that if you survive the interaction. That's why you need to also know how to defend yourself physically, including against policemen <laughs> trying to physically harm you and attack you. You need to know how to do that as well. You need to know also how to disarm them if they try to shoot you or smash you with their baton or whatever. You need to know how to deflect and disarm batons and use it against them as needed. You should study these things and be good at them, all right, and have stuff carried on you to be able to respond that way. In the case of an actual corrupt police officer, which you'll find out very quickly whether that's the case or not, if this is a guy who's out to kill you and harm you or not, because well, there it goes. He's going to be firing bullets at you or he's going to be swinging his baton at you versus just gently trying to put handcuffs on you and then, you know, coax you into the car without smashing your head against the edge of it. You see what I'm saying? <clears throat> so the more you voluntarily cooperate and streamlinedly say, am I free to go thank you, have a nice day. And you want to specifically encourage them to have a nice day because that's what you're being respectful, right? You don't want to be an asshole, fuck you, and then just slam the door. It's you being respectful, right? Or in the case of you actually being detained or arrested, well, you're respectful and firm, but you invoke your rights. I won't be answering any questions. And even corrupt policemen understand that after you've done that, you're in the right and the law is in your favor now and not in their favor if they're trying to claim or do all this other type of stuff, right? <laughs> so <clears throat> that is how you correctly go about exuding your quote-unquote rights as a sovereign citizen. Rights are simply principles that human beings agree on to mutually agree to, but at any time human beings can just decide in their emotions in the heat of their feelings to not acknowledge those rights or agree to them, right? They're not like universal laws that are built into the fucking universe for you on your behalf. No, they're strictly things humans before you have agreed on to help you, to help themselves and their future offspring, 
right? But there's no guarantee that any human being will actually acknowledge those rights ever at any time, right? It's, it's a very delusional to think because you in principle have a right that other humans agree to and only because they agree to it that you actually have it in real life reality. No, you actually don't, right? <laughs> it's just an ideal that's declared on paper. It's not a, a practical real world thing that's offered to you. Just like the pursuit of happiness is the pursuit of happiness. It's not a guarantee. It's not something you actually have. It's just an ideal, right? Listed L just like life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. These are listed as ideals. You know, it doesn't mean you're guaranteed life, liberty, or the pursuit of happiness. It just means these are the declared ideals on paper that we have as our ideals for our people. That's literally all it fucking means. It doesn't mean you actually have that in real, that's, they say unalienable rights. What that means is those are the principles we're going to ensure that us and future generations adhere to as our standard, as our standard ideal. That's what that means in terms of unalienable. It doesn't mean that, oh, we're able to guarantee that every generation and every legal person going forward is going to acknowledge those rights for you or on your behalf. We can't guarantee that. That's just the listed ideal. It's up to you to ensure that your rights are honored, and you do that by respectfully interacting with people within reason and understanding how to go about exuding your rights and win in the right way and not being an idiot, especially at traffic stops, right? Especially if it's like some routine traffic stop where they're checking a bunch of people one after the other. That's especially dumb to exude the sovereign citizen crap, uh, you know... <laughs> And go through that whole rigmarole with them because you're just going to stress a person out who's already stressed out and doesn't want to have to deal bullshit. So, like, it's not going to help you at all. You know, <laughs> it just isn't. And it's totally fucking unnecessary on top of it all, you know. So it's kind of like this. I would describe it this way. Like, if you're in a grocery store, right, <laughs> and you are... Instead of buying the bread on the shelf, you declare yourself a sovereign citizen and say, because I'm a sovereign citizen, I'm not buying the food. I'm just eating it, right? This is literally the same thing that's happening when someone's saying, I'm just traveling. I'm not driving. It's literally the same fucking thing. So let this absurdity sink into you, okay, in relationship to this thing. If you're driving around and they come up to you and say, I'm not driving. I'm traveling, right? So you're trying to claim that, okay, Driving is referring to commercial endeavors. And since I'm not running a commercial operation out of my car, I'm only traveling. That's actually not true because legally everything you're doing on the road, period, is considered a commercial transaction, no matter what it is. Even though it's not listed as commercial in those words, it is listed elsewhere as a commercial interaction. Because commercial commerce means sex. Mutually using something means you're having intercourse with that thing. So you're having intercourse with the road by using the road, by driving on it, so just like somebody else. So that is commerce with the road. Do you see? This is the reality of it. You are engaging in commerce. It's with the road though. And it's with the vehicle. And it's with others on the road. Whether you're buying or selling something on the road is irrelevant. You're using the roads. <laughs> okay? That's what driving is referring to in the hyper-technical legal law book sense, all right? <clears throat> so, yes, traveling applies to also being in a car, but being in a car specifically and in particular is driving because you could be traveling on foot or on a bike or some other means, you know, or flapping your wings and flying in the air as your mode of travel, you know. But... Driving means you're traveling via the use of a motorized vehicle or a vehicle that is a mechanical contraption that you're steering, right? Or you're operating and leading a horse. There's some contraption that you're physically manipulating to move for you. That's driving, okay? Which is distinct from just traveling, which also applies to driving, but you're doing a specific, you're engaging in a specific form of travel on the road. Let's put it that way, right? So you are driving because you're operating a vehicle. You're not just walking on the road, right? So yes, you are traveling, but you're also driving. You're traveling and driving. You're not only traveling. So somebody's saying uh, <coughs> it's irrelevant because it's false, saying I'm not driving, I'm traveling. You're doing both. 
Yeah, so a, a police officer hearing that who really understands the law correctly, he's just going to be like, okay, this is just another idiot. He literally doesn't understand the difference between the specificity, the distinction between traveling and driving that he's doing. He doesn't understand that he's doing both. This guy's so stupid. He thinks that operating a vehicle on the road is other than driving, that it's just traveling. He's literally claiming it's the same as walking on the road when it so obviously is not. It's a separate thing going on, right? So you're doing both. You're traveling and driving by operating a vehicle. So don't ever buy into this bullshit that these so-called soft idiots promote online that, no, you're not actually driving. You're only traveling. That's total fucking bullshit. You're doing both. You're driving and traveling, right? <clears throat> so <clears throat> because you're driving and traveling, because you're having commerce, which means sex, intercourse with the road, se- it, it means sex or any type of intimate interaction, right? The principle of intimate interaction is going on. Your wheels are physically moving along the asphalt, Okay. There's friction going on. There's rubbing, okay? You're moving on top of it. You're moving around on the thing, right? (laughs) There you are on it. You're on the road instead of off the road, right? You're on the road instead of on the grass. You get the point. You get the principle, right? So whatever you're on and in and with and in connection with, that's your commerce. It doesn't mean you have to be specifically buying or selling something or operating an operation of another type of commercial operation on top of the standard commerce of the interaction you're having with the road, right? And the other drivers on the road, it doesn't mean you're specifically for it to be driving. You have to be running a business out of your car, right? Like an Uber or, uh, you know, an eats operation or whatever the fuck it is or selling stuff out of your vehicle or whatever the hell else it is, because there's additional licenses for that stuff too. Operating a business out of a moving vehicle is a separate additional commerce activity from the baseline commerce activity of having commerce with the road itself, right? Commerce extends to outside of just selling and buying shit, right? This is, <laughs> this is the other thing sovereign citizens don't fucking understand. They don't understand that commercial activities extend outside of buying and selling or advertising. Most people don't understand that. Like there's a lot more commercial stuff that happens and is considered commercial stuff that goes on that isn't buying and selling or advertising. That is just a specific form of commerce. That isn't what commerce is though. Okay. This is, this is the part that yes, if there was any kind of conspiracy that was left out of the details. In fact, if there's any fucking conspiracy, part of it is to lead to a huge amount of idiots. And I'm not saying this is the case, but I'm saying if there is any conspiracy, obviously this is how it would be set up. To set up a system where a bunch of idiots would misinterpret how you have stuff written so that they think they're sovereign in ways that they actually aren't, and they create this massive movement that pisses a bunch of other people off, and it leads to a bunch of social chaos and eventually civil war and all, civil unrest and everything else to eventually weaken a country so that you can take it over and rule it. And guess who did the favor for you? All these bullshit fucking idiots doing this sovereign citizen routine. Bravo. Well done. You just fucked over our country by inducing another unnecessary civil war due to your asses being unreasonable as fuck in all your endeavors that we could have just avoided if you were just fucking reasonable and understood what the law actually means. (sighs) It never ends with these dumb fucks. It really doesn't end, you know? So, last but not least... What's the last thing I want to actually touch on here? So I hope going forward, if you've gotten sucked into this whole sovereign citizen traveling, not not driving bullshit routine and all this other stuff. Oh, that's what I was talking about. So I want to give some final hard hitting examples of how bullshitty this is. So if you're in a grocery, if you're actually a sovereign citizen, you really believe that and buy that. This is what you're going to be doing. You're going to be going into grocery stores and you're going to be just eating the bread off the shelves and walking out and not paying for it and declaring yourself a sovereign in terms of you're free to eat what you want, where you want, when you want without having to pay for it, because that's what a sovereign has the right to do. If you're a fucking king of a country, if you're King Charles, an actual sovereign acknowledged as the divine ruler of a fucking country of a land, you have the right to walk into a peasant's house 
or a serf's house or whoever's fucking house you want to walk into, grab the bread off their table and eat it as the king. You don't have to pay them. You don't have to ask their permission because you're the fucking king of the goddamn country, right? You can eat what you want, where you want, when you want. And nobody can say, no, you can't eat our food, King Charles, because you have the right, according to the law books, to eat their food. Now, they could get pissed off. Situational, they'll probably be pissed off at you. They'll probably be annoyed and emotional and what the fuck are you doing, you asshole? And they probably won't like you as a king. But in principle, according to the divine right of kings, you have the listed on paper right to do that. To just barge into somebody's house and take their food. And this happened all the fucking time during the Civil War. It was a big problem where armies that were under the leadership of generals would just barge into people's houses, take their food, so people had to take matters into their own hands. It was called the Clubman Movement, where people were individually throughout the countryside shooting at and fighting off both armies. So if you saw an army or a contingent of guys marching nearby, they would start getting fired at if there was Clubman in the area. They're like, we don't want to have anything to do with your war. What's going on? Just both of you guys stay the fuck out of our land because you're going to come and take our food. And they're like, no, we we took fucking forever to grow this shit and to store it up. You're not going to take our food for your fucking bullshitty war. Okay. And this went on during the Civil War. So but what I'm saying is <clears throat> the king did have a right to eat the food, though. Right. And nobody could hold him legally. Oh, the kid, the king came into your house and ate bread off your table. In fact, most people would consider that a an amazing blessing. If the king himself came in and ate your food, that would be considered by most people who at least were royalists on the king's side to be an incredible, like acknowledgement of your position and his recognition of you, right? Whatever rank you were, most people would be overjoyed if the king came in and just started eating out of their pantry, (laughs) you know, if they were on his side, that is right. (laughs) And pissed off if they were against his side. But like, if even if you were pissed off at him, you couldn't legally hold that against him. It's like, okay, King Charles came into my house and he ate bread off my table. Well, it's like, well, he's the sovereign. Like, he has the right to all of your food. All, not, not, not only your food that you have on your table, he has the right to all your fucking fields. And he can declare what's going to happen with them or not, because he's the king. He has the right to all your food, all your grains, all of it. Everything you've grown from seed, he has the right to. The dirt, the soil, the trees, all of it. Your entire property is his. He's the sovereign. Like, like you have no legal claim. So this is what I'm saying. This is how it was back in the day. So at that time, this is when a lot of the modern stuff started shifting in, where people started questioning the divine right of kings. Okay? Think about this for a second, folks. Think about this. We The world used to be in a situation where people didn't even question the divine right of kings. Even if people hated the fucking king's guts, they hated everything about him, We used to live in a world where people didn't question his divine right. It wasn't even a question. I I think it's just, it's amazing to me how modern people psychologically, they like, they don't even understand that this used to be the brain chemistry of most humans throughout the world, where you could totally despise a person and still believe in with every ounce of your being that he had a divine right to rule over you. He was just misusing his divine right, but that the right was still his nonetheless. This was the brain chemistry of a lot of people in the past. All right. So like nowadays, mostly everybody everywhere hates fucking elites and wealthy people and kings and queens. and They're just like, oh, what prudish fucking assholes. Fuck them. That psychology really didn't start to kick in in earnest hardcore until the American Revolution and the French Revolution. Before that, it was still divine right of kings was the thing for the most part, (laughs) you know. And it really it only really started being questioned and war started being fought about it in the mid 1600s ish thereabouts. Before then, it, it really wasn't even questioned. It was just a given. It was like, OK, if they're a king, they're a king because because most people believed in determinism in the past. Well, not only believed in it, understood determinism to a much greater degree than a lot of modern people do, ironically. So they understood, well, it's determined that the king is in his position. So they associated that determinism with God determining it. Right. So there you go. Anyway, moral of the story is if you want to understand how to correctly go about sovereign citizen stuff, read and study deeply the life of King Charles I, the English Civil War, and various other historical incidences that have to do with actual sovereigns. Okay? And then you'll learn a thing or two about how to go about your own little minuscule version of co-sovereignty with other sovereigns in the millions that surround you in the United States and other countries. Okay? 
And you'll understand how interacting with other sovereigns is different from you being a sovereign over other beings who aren't sovereigns along with you. And with that, I will talk to you soon. Have a good one. PB signing out and plunging in.